<laughs> well, hello there. I was just reading the comics, and many of you probably haven't read the comics. You haven't had the experience of reading a newspaper. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So some of the comics, uh, we call them funny pages, funny papers, actually. So it was one of my fondest memories. And I'm Susan Friel, and I'm joined today by um, Elgin and Stanford, who you'll meet in just a minute. And I wanted to let you know that we're calling, we're talking to you right now from the Chicago Cultural Center. And we have programs here virtually and in person, but of course today we're here virtually. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about an exhibition that we have called Chicago, where the comics come to life, 1880 to 1960. And that's gonna be on view here through January. So let me introduce you to my two friends, Elgin, Stanford, take it away. Hey, how's everyone doing, man? Uh, it's, it's nice to meet everyone virtually today. My name is Elgin Bokari. Um, I'm joining you today also uh, in Chicago and also as a part of this amazing event. Um, and also we have Stanford, uh, who is an anthropologist, uh, make some noise for Stanford Carpenter. How you doing, Stanford? <laughs> So we both are here uh, representing a comic book convention that we put on. Uh, it's called uh, Pocket Con. I'm actually the co-creator of the convention. I'm going to show you guys just a little bit of what it looks like. Um, and actually, we're on our 10th year. And it's a comic book convention that celebrates characters of color. This year, we will be back uh, virtually because, you know, it's a little unsafe to be trying to do anything in person. So we will be virtual. This will be our second year doing a virtual version of this convention. And it's great, man. I really enjoy it. Um, and we have lots of talks. Uh, the whole purpose of this comic book convention is to make a space for young people to be able to see themselves um, on pages, you know, um, as well as uh, celebrate characters and creators of color. Uh, like I said, again, this is our 10th year doing this particular comic book convention, and it takes place at the Chicago Cultural Center. Matter of fact, we've done the convention at the Cultural Center, I think, Ooh, has it been four years, four and a half years at this point? And uh, we'll be back again. So uh, yeah, uh, Stanford is uh, very much one of our biggest collaborators on this uh, convention. Anything you want to say about like the environment or uh, why this type of convention is important, Stanford, as a person who's been a historian for so many years? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, one of the things that I find really that I think is really important about these kinds of events. I'm involved with, with Pocket Con. We've been doing this for, for many, many years. I'm also involved with um, the Black and Brown Comic Arts Festival out in San Francisco. Um, there, there's also, you know, there, these, event, these events are, are starting to really take stream. And what I find to be the most interesting thing about them is that because they're small and because they're focused, um, when we bring in, um, when we bring in comic creators, when we bring in scholars, um, it's a venue where the kids can actually meet them. You know, if you go to a really, really large comic convention like a C2E2, there will be a ton of stuff and a ton of people, and you might be able to see your see your 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 favorite comic creator from the nosebleed seats, but you won't get to actually interact with them in the way that you can at at, at an event like PocketCon. Absolutely. I have like a short little video to kind of give you guys an idea of, you know, what the whole point of the convention was. This is a quick video that was made through Three Arts, uh, Three Arts Chicago, uh, that kind of best explains a little bit of why we do this particular comic book convention. So enjoy. Project is PocketCon. PocketCon is a comic book convention that celebrates characters of color and diversity within the comic book universe. We started off in the year 2011, and there was not very much representation of characters of color. Teaching visual arts at the time, I noticed that a lot of students mostly only drew anime or the characters just didn't look like them. I remember, uh, asking the students in my class, like, yo, who knows any characters of color? And they would be like, uh, Batman. <laughs> it's like, they would say Batman because he's black, as in like his suit is black. Youth are always going to create, right? Then they're going to create characters that, that they see. So if you don't see any black characters in anime or any characters that look like them, then why am I going to draw it? 
you have to see some people that look like you doing it in order for you to want to do it. So Pocket Con is about making space, you know, creating community. And then when you go inside, you see a sea of people that look like you and it's free. We've never charged our artists for tables. We've never charged youth for entry. And we've been growing a lot. As we raise the bar, that means there's more expenses that come. We are being active. So I'm gonna stop right there, uh, just because it's, I think that's a good like blanket of like what the convention actually is about and why we do it. Um, and also uh, to introduce Stanford, uh, he actually got a chance to work on this really amazing uh, documentary, which is called White Scripts and Black Superman. So I'm gonna show you guys this trailer and then we're gonna have a, a quick convo with Stanford a little bit about like the, why it's important for creators of color uh, to be in there, which leads us ultimately into talking about this, uh, you know, the folks that we want to highlight in this particular um, gallery. So um, I'm going to show you this quick trailer uh, featuring some amazing uh, talents. For you. So hold on one second. And this one is uh, Stanford. When was this documentary produced? I know. Um, I want to say 20, 2012, 2013. Okay. Yeah. So this is the trailer for White Scripts on Black Superman. And you all can purchase this if you want to like watch it for yourself. Um, yeah, here we go. Looks like the sound is out. Yeah. That's weird. It's not turned down. Uh, okay. Well, that's, that's strange. Um, hold on a second. So let me figure out what's going on with that one. <laughs> I don't know what, why the sound just decided not to play right now for that particular video. Probably we can't handle all that amazingness. But um, the purpose of it is, hold on a second. Stanford, you want to give like an overview of basically what the documentary is about while I try to figure this? this Sure, sure. I mean, the the person who did who created the documentary, his name is Jonathan Gales. He's, he's also a Black anthropologist, which makes him part of a crew that's very, very small. Um, he, he, for him, what, what he wanted to do is to talk about Black representation in comics. And he lined up several creators and scholars and asked all of us to talk a little bit about, about some of the issues having to do with black creators from, from, from the early beginnings and into the, you know, in, into the, into the present day, which is actually kind of yesterday. Um, but um, for example, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, one of the things that he asked me about was a character called, called Tyrock and Wonder Woman. And I was talking, and one of the things I talked a lot about is, um, is how they, would design the costumes, and especially back in the in the seventies, a lot of the a lot of the black superheroes start to really come to being in comic books in the sixties and seventies. And uh, one of the things, and we can talk a little bit about it more later as well, is that is that they were really kind of like groping around in the dark trying to create these characters. A lot of times, it was creative teams of like four or five people, and there may not be any black people on the creative team. And sometimes you get you you get characters that that have some problems. Um, so so for example, um, one thing that used to happen a lot is a lot of the um, black male characters, especially, would they go out of their way to give them costumes that showed their skin so that everybody knew they were black. So you get uh, Luke Cage with a with mm. uh, and Black Lightning both with with their shirts unbutton all the way down to their navel right um and you get a character and they also have black in their name so you have a, a character that grows you call black Goliath and again he's wearing he's wearing shorts um and um and so one a, a quote that everybody makes fun of me for after having said this was was he asked me about 
about Tyrock, which is a black character. And I was like, you know, and I, I was like, like, yeah, I mean, he really looked like he could have been a member of Earth, Wind and Fire, like kids, like in a 70s musical group, except without pants. And, and, and I said, I said, come on, give the guy some pants. And to this day, anybody who's seen this, seen this thing walks up to me and says, hey, Dr. Carpenter, give him some pants. Um, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's where it came from. And it's actually a problem you also have with a lot of female characters is they don't get to wear pants, which seems like a really, it, it, seems, it, it seems weird to say it. It's funny, but it's, it's a funny way of identifying some of the ways in which early on the industry would mark, would mark characters that are different in ways that is not comp that are not complimentary. I mean, Wonder Woman is a great example as well, right? She's running around, she's fighting monsters, she's fighting supervillains, and she doesn't get to wear pants. No, and also Tyra <laughs> is not. I finally got the clip up. I'm sorry, guys. It was I don't, I'm not sure it was my computer's acting um, like. And also lots of cleavage. <laughs> yes. But here you guys go. Here you guys go. African-American male superhero characters um, have, have a burden, an added burden of being seen as sort of hyper-masculine. You know, the whole black buck, angry black man stereotype. Until the past 20 years, everyone was writing as whites. So whether the depiction was something I embraced or, or rejected is still white people writing. The minute they saw a black comic book in there, they sent the bundles back. So it was a catastrophe for Dell Comics. And and if somebody like Luke Cage represents one pole of the black superheroes, then uh, the Black Panther is all the way at the other end. Black Panther is the first black character, but he's not the first American who is black in comics. Like it's it's the Falcon. African American is the Falcon. They didn't do a John Stewart comic. They didn't make John Stewart the Green Lantern in their Justice League. They didn't pick up on it because they're very comfortable with what they were doing. I had, how can I describe it? I had a love-hate relationship with Luke Cage. Yeah, you know, man, this is weird. I like Luke Cage, but I was also a little bit embarrassed. I never really understood what Hero for Hire meant. And he said, man, you gotta pay him. You don't have to pay, you know, you only have to pay Hulk. He, on instinct, he turns green. You know what I mean? And, and he'll destroy everything, but he'll still get the villain. You know, so I started thinking about that, like, wow, man, you know, I'm spending my lunch money on this. A thousand years in the future, black folks on a planet where the black people are slaves in some slave ship world. And when they are free, they dress up like um, Victorian Europeans. That needs to be critiqued. Critiqued in a way that shows the problem, the ongoing way in which America has conceptualized black folk. People kid about it now, you know, they never call them white super Superman, but you know, Jeff Pierce is proud of the name Black Lightning. It's like, I tell people, we had to have something to start with. And where you start is nothing about where you end up, obviously not. So yeah, that I think that perfectly, perfectly like encompasses of what uh, we were just having this conversation about. Um, Stanford, what was it? So continuing on with the conversation about Tyrock and um, and your your infinity, especially when this came out, there was not a there wasn't a Black Lightning TV show. There was not a Luke Cage Netflix series. Uh, we didn't have a Black Panther movie at the time. How do you feel now seeing like these characters now being like more Broadway on screen and like are kind of like into our, our normal like zeitgeist at this point? Like, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I mean, simply put, it feels good. Um, you know, but what I, what I think is really interesting is that now we're starting to, um, as more information comes out, we're having a greater recognition um, and more dialogue over, you know, what it means to create superheroes, what they, what they mean to America. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of us, and I in particular would argue that, um, 
that that superhero comics have become have become our American mythology, right? More people more people can recognize the Superman logo, tell you what his powers are, his secret identity, and give the basic gist of gist of the origin of Superman than read it, than read it, than actually read his stories, right? So it's not just about the comics. It's about the stories we tell. It's about watching, you know, it, it's about watching Saturday Night Live and seeing them do a skit that makes fun of Superman, but still they're evoking Superman. Why? Because everybody knows who Superman is, you know? So, so to, to, to expand um, and, and, and that, it's not even, it's not entirely an expansion because there's, there's always been a lot more diversity in comics than, um, than, than we want to admit or that we talk about. Um, but to see it expand, I mean, and to see everybody see other, other people as heroes is really about, about, about getting into and talking about how we are as a society. So, um, you know, I, I, so for example, I've always argued that, that um, superheroes always ask a very simple question. And it's a simple, it's a question that we, that we grapple with as we grow, you know, from, from childhood and into adulthood, which is what do we do when we have power? Right. The, you know, if you're if you're if you're um, if you're Shazam, you know, you say if you're Captain Marvel, you say Shazam, you get this power. You're transformed into somebody who is more powerful than yourself. Right. And ask the question, what do you do? You know, um, and and it bring and, and from that question comes what what are the things that I want and what are the things that are appropriate or responsible? Right. Because um, that's the difference between the hero and the villain. It's the, the hero misuses his power, the villain does not. Well, let's work with that simple idea and ask ourselves, if, if you cannot see somebody who is not like you having power, can you ever see them as your equal? Wow. Yeah. And I think that that is, and I think that's what, that's, that's the door that gets opened when we start opening the door as to who gets to be the hero. Right. It's it is it, it is about it, it is as much about me seeing myself as it is about uh, seeing myself and, 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 and getting that that feeling. But it's also about other people, uh, you know, you know, my friends who are not like me looking at me and thinking I could be right. That's a that that is a different kind of um, it's it's a it's an important relationship to grow it's 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 what allows for for friendship it's what allows for fellowship and it's and if you want to talk about a society where people are equal you have to see people you have to see everybody in that society as being capable of doing all of the things right on man and i mean i I, I absolutely 100% agree um and thank you for that sentiment you know cuz now and and as I've been researching, one of the things of, uh, if we're talking about this gallery that is currently up at the Chicago Cultural Center, uh, things that like doing this comic book convention, I, I'm, it might sound weird, you know, to some folks, but even when I used to go to C2E2 or, you know, any of the comic book conventions, I'm always looking for myself there. So like I would go to C2E2 and be like, where are the black creators at? You know, what kind of stories are y'all telling, right? Um, and so when I went to the gallery, that was one of the first things that I did. I, I went, I went around, I was like, where are the black folk? You know, where's the black people at? Like, where's the, where's the black comic book creators of time? And I was pleasantly surprised to find quite a few, um, more than I anticipated to be honest. Uh, cause you, you know, you never really know. Uh, what you're going to get. And I was surprised. Uh, and, you know, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. And one of the first things that, you know, I stood out to me was a couple of pieces of work that was done by Jay Jackson. Um, and right off the back, I was like, well, who are these people? Like, I, I want to know all about, you know, these cats. And then I found more and come to find out that most of the creators that I was seeing were from the Defender. Now, being from St. Louis, I didn't know very much about the Chicago Defender. Um, so it was all news to me. 
but apparently the defender was created um and published by one of the first black self-made millionaires who goes by the name of uh, robert s avid um and i'm gonna show you guys a quick little clip about him and then we can talk a little bit more about the creators and in the groundbreaking things that they were doing at the defender themselves so when we're talking about telling your own stories uh, and being narrators of your own stories, you see that things can be, um, when you have other, when you have white creators telling black stories, it's not necessarily authentic, right? We saw Dwayne McDuffie in, uh, for those of you all that don't know, Dwayne McDuffie is a part of a group that created a comic book label called Milestone Media. Um, shout outs to them, I have a couple, you know, Icon comic books, you know, and all that, and, you know, hardware was their first, you know, book to come out. Uh, and these were published in the 90s. We got the new ones. Yes, the new ones. Yes, they are actually on the shelves right now. If you guys are wondering, uh, Milestone Media is back. They are a sub uh, group under DC, but they have now been re-added. There have been a lot of lawsuits. Uh, so yeah, probably wondering like why, why does it take so long for us to be able to see these people back and whatnot? Uh, if you, you if you think you never heard of Milestone Media, you probably are sadly mistaken because if you're a young person growing up in the 90s, you probably watched a little cartoon by the name of Static Shock. Uh, and that was probably... Uh, Elgin, Elgin um, a lot of these people might not have been alive in the 90s. Oh, Okay, so yeah, probably, okay, well, there was a cartoon in the 90s, it was called Static Shock, it was a great cartoon, uh, give a little clip, there you go, mm. I'm now rich, I'm vibing, oh, that's a, that's a CD, um, that he's using, yeah, I probably don't know what that is either, uh, but back in the day, you used to watch, you used to listen to music and watch movies on little discs and stuff, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that I have to say that now. Now I know how my parents felt about eight tracks. But uh, yeah, you, you know, Elgin, if you don't want to sound old, what you say is, "Oh, when I was doing my archival research, there you go. Yes, I discovered that they listened to music on these round things called CDs." As, as I sit here with my with my uh, records in the background, uh, <laughs> yeah. And if you do want to watch this entire cartoon series, if you have um, HBO Max, they actually do. They finally uploaded uh, the entire Static Shock cartoon. But that whole series was created um, by a team uh, under Milestone Media, and they finally uh, they finally had that on HBO Max. Go check it out. It's a great cartoon. Uh, but again, actually, Icon, Icon and Static appear um, very, um, re recently, like in the last couple of years, on a show called Young Justice, which is yeah. also available on HBO Max um, and, and has been out since you were alive. Yes. I'm just wondering if any of our folks out there have seen any of these comics, you know? I mean, if you could just have your teacher or write yourself in the chat and let us know, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? Is this like a whole new language to you or are you seeing stuff? So let us know, particularly artists of color. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we want to make sure you guys are knowing that. But first, let's talk about this man who probably paved the way for what we see now um, and being able to have these comic books, these comic strips being published in a um, in, in uh, the Defender magazine. So this is a little bit about uh, Robert S. Abbott. I'm going to show you this a bit. Oh, no, it's doing that thing again. Okay, all right. You're like, we're not, you, you're not about to play these videos, but you know what I'm do? I'm a, I'm a Robert S. Abbott, one go. of the first African-American self-made millionaire. Come on. Robert S. Abbott, one of the first African-American self-made millionaires, was the founder of the Chicago Defender, which became known as America's Black Newspaper. Mr. Abbott started the Chicago Defender in 1905 with an initial investment of 25 cents. His newspaper became the most widely circulated black newspaper in the country. The slogan he established for his paper, American race prejudice must be destroyed, reflected his belief about what the ideal experience should be for black Americans or any American. He used the pages of the Chicago Defender to not only encourage people to migrate north for a better life, but also fight for an even better lifestyle once they arrive. The newspaper's columns helped to bring about the great migration of black Americans from the rural south to northern industrial centers, 
which had an abundant need of workers to manufacture goods for World War I. By 1916, the Chicago Defender's circulation reached 50,000. It climbed to 125,000 by 1918 and achieved an unprecedented 200,000 by the early 1920s. This incredible increase in circulation resulted from Mr. Abbott's superb strategy of using the nationwide network created by the Black Pullman Company Railroad Porters. Not only that, uh, so <laughs> not only that, but we also found out that this man was also the original creator and founder of the Chicago's very own Bud Billiken Bay Parade. But Billiken was actually started off as a comic book character created by Abbott and his team. And uh, Stanford has a little bit of extra if, uh, information about like what that character in meant. You want to tell them a little bit about that, Stanford? Well, the character was actually a, um, the character was a guardian for children. And the character, like his role was to look out for, for children and in a black strip, um, black children, right? Um, and I think that, that, that that's one of the things that's interesting because Elders and I were talking about this earlier and, it, and it's like a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, they think that, that the parade is named for, a, you know, a flesh and blood person. But I think that this also speaks to, you know, I, you know, the, the fancy way of saying is the mythic quality. Um, but that is that, 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 you know, these characters, they may be created for a comic strip or a comic book, but they take on lives outside of the pages. You know, mm. people retell the stories. Um, people tell jokes based on the characters or people make comparisons, you know, back to the Superman comparison. So much. say, oh, look, you're strong, just like Superman, right? You know, I mean what happens is, is these characters become, they, 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 start, they start on the page, but, but they become much more meaningful. Absolutely, man. So, I mean, it's just, it's really interesting to see like how the legacy lives on as well. Or it's like hearing a story of a story of a story and then we forget like how these things, <laughs> you know, like uh, I, I, I've heard that like people thought that like, but Billiken was like a pelican or something like that too. It's just, it's so... <laughs> It's it's always so interesting to see that how that goes. But this man was great. I mean, like, um, also, uh, this comic, this this newspaper was like their whole focus and goal off in the beginning was literally to help, uh, in, to help uh, stop Jim Crow era. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was uh, they were directly speaking on issues that a lot of us are even like still think is taboo or like oh we can't say that or anything like that like long before and, and to think about the legacy of something like the boondocks being you know a direct um successor from something that was started at the defender like way way back then um we're talking about black millionaires you know who started their own press and company and were able to figure these things out all the way back then it's, it's just it's really interesting this is uh uh robert abbott at his uh, his desk working diligently and not only that but employing black folks um at the time too you know so it's, it's really um uh also another person that was extremely important throughout that time is he also hired the first um and I think throughout that time was the only black female um, comic book creator uh, was under that label as well. And under the defender, her name is, um, hold on a second. Jackie Orms. The Jackie yes. Orms. Yeah. Yeah. So like also someone that was extremely integral throughout that time as well too. Conversations that were difficult at the time, 
uh, using this as a means of also creating a first black female doll that could be that was not racist <laughs> throughout that time, you know, like. So the big well, I think, that- you know, when you talk about like the whole range of people seeing themselves and all the different facets, you know, one of our participants, Anika, pointed out that she uh, remembers reading the comic series Lumberjanes. Do you know that series? They had yeah. quite a few characters yeah. of color, LGBTQ folks, you know, and so I think it's just it's, you know, becoming easier to find. But I think it's really interesting to note that these ones that you're pointing out were like early 1900s. So like, you know, nearly 100 years ago in some of these cases. So. Um, you have to just kind of keep looking for them, you know, and we're going to be wrapping up here in a little bit. So I just want to kind of keep us on task here. I think it's in- interesting is that when you start getting into the early 1900s, you know, I mean, it's, it's simple. It's, you know, on one hand, I would say there was no internet, but what it means that there is no internet means that, that these newspapers, um, people were reading the Chicago Defender in Florida they were reading it in California. The Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, these black newspapers were national newspapers because they were being spread all over the place. And, and it was mentioned earlier about, about the connection to the, to, the, um, to the Pullman carriers is that they actually had, there were black men who worked on trains that would also bring these newspapers along and spread them out into black communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 that's why that that's where these the, why these papers were so powerful, why these characters were so interesting. And what's unfortunate is there's really not a lot of um, the, we don't have very many of these black comic strips being being published. Like it's like most people can't even envision them, right? Um, but back then, I mean, they were they were doing they were doing black strips about all aspects of black life, and yeah. also they 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 started to eventually started creating different types of of superhero characters. Um, you know, one in particular I think of is like a character called Jive Gray, who was kind of like an Indiana Jones type character, um, and this character was being published published back in the back in the forties, right? You know, we but 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 we grow up and we don't even know about these characters. And um, one thing that's interesting is um, right now I'm working on a project where it's very likely that where, where we're going to be talking about that history and we are going to be reproducing um, these old comic strips in particular, a um, it's a um, an insert. It was a color insert that was put in the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender in the, um, in the late forties, early fifties. And it would have like five different, five different strips 
um, but most people haven't seen it. And right now there's a group of us who are work, who are actually working on getting them out there. So that like probably about next, probably around some, this time next year, you'll actually be able to read these stories. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's, that's so great. I mean, to think about, like you were saying, when previously it was like a physical newspaper being passed down by couriers or um, porters rather, now everything is online. And that kind of brings me right into our, our next uh, kind of, shameless plug here that PocketCon will be occurring virtually this year. So it's a way for everyone to participate, whether or not you're in Chicago or wherever you happen to be. Um, If you are in Chicago, though, I just want to say you can come to the Chicago Cultural Center and see the exhibition, which will be up through January 23rd. Um, If you're not in Chicago and you want to check it out online, um, I'm going to put up a slide here in just a second. Um, And I want to thank both Elgin and Stanford, you guys are amazing. Thank you for being here and for continuing all the great work that you're doing. Um, we have a series actually at the Cultural Center uh, Pocket Con where we're having like in-person workshops, but they're also going to be recorded so you can see them that way. And there you go. There's the slide that shows the comics, the exhibition that's held, the installation shot. And you can reach out to us directly at that address, dcasevolunteers.org, if you want to come and see the show or if you want to see the show and images of it. And if you have any questions, there's our way of getting in touch with us wherever you are. Um, any parting words, Elgin, Stanford? Um, no, just thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that this, uh, if anything, just sparked an interest to want to come and see these things live. It's one thing to also see, you know, comics hold to, to, experience them virtually and whatnot but uh i encourage everyone to go specifically and, and hold it in your hand go look at these people's work directly yeah. it's it's way more just to see yourself um if you are a person of color or just have some interest in what these people were doing way back then it is my my goal was to make sure that you guys get a little bit of a taste go check out um <laughs> space for Daniel Day. Check out Leslie Rogers, uh, Jay Jackson, Jackson, and of course, Jackie Orms. Uh, They are the ones that I really say to go spend some time and and really (laughs) explore what they got going on. I mean, there's other great, amazing comics, but I want to go find those people also. Well, now that we scratched the surface, hopefully you guys are interested in learning some more. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, people. Thank you both. Thank you, guys. Thank you.